In 19th century Bengal, there lived a boy called Gadadhar, whose life sounds like a work of fiction. One of India's most revered saints, he once held a sword to his neck in his endless devotion towards the goddess Kali. He rolled around naked, rebuked social behavior, got lost in states of trance, and broke endless expectations. He lost control of his body and mind, not once or twice, but several times. Many believed that madness had gripped him. Gadadha later came to be known as Ramakrishna Paramhansa, a mystic and spiritual leader. He tried all sects of Hinduism, converted to Islam, then Christianity, and later died of throat cancer, but not without leaving a thriving order of people dedicated to his cause. Was he really mad or so divine that it is beyond rational understanding? Do even the saintliest of all people have madness within them? How do you explain this life full of miracles, madness and ecstasy? In a small village of Bengal, in the middle of palm trees, ponds and rice fields called Kamar Kupur, there lived an orthodox Brahmin couple, the Chattopadhyayas. Living their life in poverty, they were stern devotees of Rama. The father, at the age of 60, went on a pilgrimage to Gaya. In Gaya, Lord Vishnu visited him and said, I am about to be reborn for the salvation of the world. Moreover, if you don't believe in coincidences and their messages, that might change. Around the same time that the man was visited by Vishnu, the woman was being graced by the almighty Shiva back in Kamarkupur. The divine image of Shiva in a temple opposite her cottage came to life right in front of her eyes. The woman, Chandramani, was overwhelmed and suddenly fainted. She conceived by the grace of God and heard voices that she carried a god. The child, who would later be known as Ramakrishna Paramhansa, was born on February the 18th, 1836. He was called Gadadhar Chattopadhyay. Although the parents had been overwhelmed with visions before his birth, the child's life till the age of six was as ordinary as it could be. Then one day, in the summer of 1884, as he was munching a small ball of rice, he saw a great black cloud spreading rapidly until he was covered with them overhead. And he experienced his first spiritual ecstasy. In Ramakrishna's own words, he explained later, Suddenly, at the edge of the clouds, a flight of snow-white cranes passed over my head. The contrast was so beautiful that my spirit wandered far away. I lost consciousness and fell to the ground. The puffed rice was scattered. Somebody picked me up and carried me home in their arms. An excess of joy and emotion overcame me. This was the first time that I was seized with ecstasy. This moment turned the tides of his internal life before he began the outward journey towards both madness and divinity. This moment opened up in him an artistic self, a passionate instinct for seeing godly beauty through artistic means. By the age of eight, Ramakrishna was fully indulged. He had inculcated a passionate love for music and poetry, was a skillful modeler of images and led a small drama group of boys the same age as him. After his first ecstasy, visions, trance states and the like only continued to grow, as did his family's concern for him. With the demise of his father, the next few years became rather difficult for the family, with a severe lack of resources. During the same time, a rich woman named Rani Rashmani founded a Kali temple in Dakshineshwar on the eastern bank of the Ganges, some four miles from Calcutta. Rani Rashmani belonged to the Shudra caste, the caste which is understood to be at the fourth and the lowest in the caste system followed by Hinduism. Being a Shudra, most people with their caste-based reservations were not willing to serve as a priest for the temple. Gadadhar's elder brother, Ram Kumar, took up the task upon himself in 1855. At first, Gadadhar had a very strict sense of caste and reconciled with the idea with great difficulty. But after his brother's death in 1855, he decided to take his place. The place he had so many reservations and doubts about would offer him his first chance of devotion so great that it was almost maddening. Ramakrishna was only 20 when he began his priesthood 
at the Kali Temple in Dakshineshwar. The temple in totality formed the trinity of the nature mother Kali, the absolute Shiva and the love of Radha and Krishna. But Kali always reigned as the sovereign deity of the complex. A basalt figure of Kali dressed in Banaras silk danced upon the outstretched body of Shiva. In her two left arms, she held a sword and a severed head. On the right, she offered gifts. She represented nature, the destroyer and the creator, the universal mother. From those who give themselves to Kali, she takes away the last trace of the ego and absorbs it into the consciousness of the absolute. The finite ego loses itself to the infinite ego, the Atman, the Brahman. And it was Ramakrishna who was closest to Kali day in and day out. As the priest, he was associated with all the intimate acts related to her. He dressed and undressed her and offered her flowers and food. The very first time that he touched Kali, she stung him. He could feel her in his fingers and they were united forever. But then she left. She withheld from him. Passion for the goddess consumed him. To receive from her again, to immerse him in her, became the sole purpose of his existence. In the wild part of the garden, he spent all his time praying and meditating. He tore off all his clothes. He even let go of the sacred thread, the janeu, which Brahmins aren't allowed to remove throughout life. But his love for Kali revealed to him that no one can contemplate God while being weighed down by prejudices. He shed his ego, his skin. He lost control over himself. Like a madman, he writhed on the ground in front of visitors. He became an object of pity, mockery of scandal. Yet, he didn't care. He reached the limits of physical endurance and the limits of his mental sanity. One such day, he saw a sword hanging in the temple of Kali. He seized the sword with rigor. And then, as if brought back right from the edge, he explains in his own words, The whole scene, doors, windows, the temple itself, vanished. It seems as if nothing existed anymore. I saw an ocean of the spirit, boundless, dazzling. Around me rolled an ocean of ineffable joy. And in the depths of my being, I was conscious of the presence of the Divine Mother, Kali. But the shock of this first encounter with Kali was so violent that his whole being remained in an unpleasant state. He had now lost control of his eyes, his body and his mind. He was possessed by Kali. One night, when he couldn't sleep, he saw Kali walk the temple and heard her anklets ring. To see if he was dreaming, he went up to the terrace only to confirm what he was feeling. It was her, with unbound hair, watching the Ganga flow. He was now one with Kali. But to most people, he was driven insane. He was no longer capable of performing priestly duties. In the middle of rituals, he would often be jolted into fits of unconsciousness, sudden collapses. He'd become so stiff, as if a statue. For a long period of devotion, he never closed his eyes, and he no longer ate. Small amounts of blood dripped through his skin, and his whole body seemed on fire. He began to see gods and the people around them, but not metaphorically. He saw Sita in a sex worker, and in a young British man, he saw Krishna. He too himself saw that he was Kali, he was Sita, that he was Radha and Krishna, that he was Hanuman. When he was Hanuman, he acted like a monkey. As Sita, he became a woman. It was only because his nephew cared for him that he continued to live. Did he turn to madness in striving for divinity? Was he walking the path of God with closed eyes? Anxiety around his behavior led his caregivers to send him back to his village of Kamarpukur and surfaced his mother's wish of getting him married, hoping this would cure him of his divine enchantment. In 1859, he was married to a child of five, Sharadamani. According to the customs of child marriage, Sharada was sent back to the house of her parents after the ceremonial marriage took place and didn't see Ramakrishna for another few years, while Ramakrishna returned to the Kali temple. But not much changed. Kali returned into him and ever so violently. His madness multiplied tenfold and he would see demonic figures emerging from within him. The horror of these emotions paralyzed his limbs. For the next two years, this was his life. 
intoxicated by Kali and despair. And finally, help came. Ramakrishna had been walking the road alone, swimming in this vast ocean without any guidance, slowly losing his mind. One such day, when he was peeping at the boats darting to and fro the Ganga, he saw one of them stop at the foot of his terrace. A tall woman with unbound hair came up the steps. She bore the saffron robe of a sannyasin, a person who has reached the stage of sannyas and has renounced material possession, a stage of sacrifice which leads to liberation from the cycle of death and rebirth on moksha. As soon as she saw Ramakrishna, she said, My son, I have been looking for you for a long, long time. A highly educated woman, learned in holy scriptures, she had been revealed of Ramakrishna's existence through the Spirit and she had been given a message regarding this man inspired by God. In Bhairavi Brahmani, Ramakrishna found solace. He confided in her and told her of all the tortured experiences of his sadhana, the misery of his bodily and mental suffering. He asked her the question that you might be thinking of while watching this video. He asked her if he had indeed gone mad. Bhairavi heard all his confessions and asked him to have no fear. She told him that he had reached one of the highest states of sadhana as described in the bhakti texts and that his sufferings were the measure of his ascent. She stayed for Ramakrishna, looked after his body while she enlightened his mind. Up until now, Ramakrishna had been obtaining his realizations through instinct alone, but now a master had arrived to show him the way. Bhairavi, now as his guru, made him try all roads of sadhana as per the scriptures. She even instructed Ramakrishna in the tantras, which exposed the senses and the spirit to all disturbances of the flesh, only so that they can be overcome. This was not an easy path and was certainly full of numerous dangers. Often many who practice tantra give in to degradation and madness and seldom return from their ventures. Ramakrishna, however, despite his dispossession to break material boundaries, didn't give in. He came back from the depths of tantric practice, purely and divinely. Through her numerous teachings, Bhairavi Brahmani had acquainted Ramakrishna with all forms of union with God through love, through bhakti. He had embodied the 19 bhavs or attitudes and emotions of the soul in the presence of its God. His guru not only made him well versed in bhakti, but also truly saw Ramakrishna for who he was with pure conviction. She recognized that he was indeed an incarnation of divinity. As soon as this realization came upon her, she called a meeting at Dakshineshwar with pundits and upon discussion, she insisted that the theological authorities publicly recognize him as the new avatar, a manifestation of a deity on earth. People came from all around to meet the person who had completed all sadhanas. Towards the end of 1854, Ramakrishna had been recognized by most and the next turn in his spiritual journey arrived at Dakshineshwar. In the presence of Bhairavi, he had already experienced Savikalpa Samadhi, through which he had temporarily dissolved into the Brahman. But now what? Vedanta entered Ramakrishna's life through a wandering ascetic called Totapuri, the Naked One. When Totapuri offered to teach him Vedanta, Ramakrishna asked for his leave from Kali and submitted to Totapuri's tests, the tests of true detachment. To let go of the Brahmanic and priestly privileges was rather easy for him. But what about his attachment to his god, for whom he had time and again entered the realms of madness? The test was to symbolically conduct his funeral service. He had to bury his ego and his heart. He reclothed himself in the saffron robe of a sannyasi and Advaita Vedanta began. Ramakrishna himself said, The naked man Totapuri taught me to detach my mind from all objects and to plunge it into the heart of the Atman. The last barrier between him and his true spirit fell. He was finally able to detach himself from the Divine Mother and lost himself in Nirvikalp Samadhi, where the subject and the object all disappeared. He attained Brahman. Seeing how he had reached in one day, where it had taken Totapuri 40 years, Totapuri was convinced Paramhansa was special. The Totapuri, who never stayed in one place for more than three days, stayed with Ramakrishna for 11 months and saw the student transform into the Guru. 
But Ramakrishna went a step further, for whenever his thirst was quenched, he sought further ahead. Through the Vedantic road, he discovered that Maya itself was God, for everything was God. But Maya too is one face of Brahman. He first imparted this teaching to his guru, who accepted that Brahman and Shakti, which comprise Maya, are the same being. Totapuri's job here was done. But the ever-expanding Paramhansa's volcanic curiosity did not stop erupting. He looked further. Towards the end of 1865, Totapuri left, and Ramakrishna remained in Nirvikalpa Samadhi in a kind of cataleptic ecstasy. As his nephew took care of his physical body, he kept himself engrossed in an ecstatic union with the formless, in a yogic trance. Would he come back? Ramakrishna had said several times that the Divine Mother called him back, or rather forced him back, from Nirvikalpa Samadhi to fulfill his duties. During the first days of his return, he howled with pain. When he saw anger in people, his heart was scarred. He gained a divine state of empathy, where he could deeply identify with the sorrows of the world. The period of anguish kindled by seeing the suffering of the world brought him to one of his major realizations. A realization that during the 19th century was pivotal in uniting people for a higher purpose, for peace. He recognized that all religions led to the same God via different paths. He was now eager to explore these paths. The first path he explored was Islam. Around 1866, he asked Wajid Ali Khan, a newly converted Muslim, to initiate him. Wajid, whose name had previously been Gobind Rai, followed Sufi Islam and was probably a believer of Wadat ul Wajud. He used to offer his namaz at the Mazar of Ghazi Pir, the famous 13th century Sufi saint. Since this Mazar was right next to the Kali temple, Ramakrishna had already begun visiting and discussing Islam with Khan. He decided to convert and leave Hinduism. He became a practicing Muslim and reached divine realization in a mere three days. On the third day, he experienced a vision of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. This experience led him back into the ocean of Advaita and he came back to his sadhana. But this experience also left a lasting imprint on him. After a decade, around 1876, he was ready for another experiment. He once happened to hear verses from the Bible from one of his devotees, Shambhu Charan Malik. Struck by its teachings, he started practicing Christianity. Entranced by the vision he had of Jesus Christ merging in his body, flowing even more powerfully than during his experience of Islam, his Hindu ideas were swept away. For several days, he didn't go into the Kali temple and was brimming with Christian thought and Christian love. In his Christian ecstasy, he came to realize that Christ too, like Buddha and Krishna, were for him incarnations or avatars. Ramakrishna said, I have practiced all religions, Hinduism, Islam, Christianity, and I've also followed the paths of the different Hindu sects. I have found that it is the same God whom all are directing their steps through different paths. You must try all beliefs and traverse all the different ways once. Ramakrishna, after all his revelations, had but one wish. He didn't want to become a dried-up ascetic. He prayed to the mother to remain in consciousness for the love of humanity. In May of 1867, he went back to his village of Kamarpukur after eight years. During his visit, he was reacquainted with his wife, Sharada. He saw in her a spiritual development far greater than her age of 14. She instantly saw in Paramahansa a spiritual guide and put herself at his service. This transaction didn't take place without a choice. Ramakrishna offered to give up his sadhana to fulfill his worldly duties if she asked of it. Ramakrishna, in his discourse, always recognized that worldly duties and relationships have binding rights over an individual. And this applied to him as well. She, however, encouraged him to pursue his mission. During his time at Kamar Kupur, he devoted himself to her education. By the end of the year, he returned to Dakshineshwar only to broaden his understanding through his travels. With Mathur Babu, his patron and the master of his temple, he went on several pilgrimages. He saw Banaras and Allahabad at the sacred junction of the Ganga and Yamuna. 
He went to Vrindavan, sang and danced in ecstasy. He had met these gods before, but now he met something else. He saw the face of mass human suffering. Ramakrishna believed as he said, Maya is Shiva. Who then dares talk of showing mercy to others? No mercy, but service. Service must be regarded as God. During this period of divine communication with all that is living, Sharada came to visit him at Dakshineshwar in 1872. One night in May of the same year, when preparation for worship had been completed, he made Sharada Devi sit in the very seat of Kali. As a priest, he conducted the Sharashi Puja, symbolizing the adoration of womanhood. Both husband and wife entered a state of superconscious ecstasy and Paramhansa hailed his companion as the Divine Mother. As though the dots were connecting themselves for Ramakrishna's influence over the world to increase, he was acquainted with the Brahmo Samaj. His charisma began to attract youngsters and he had a meeting with Keshab C. Sen. Sen was to become a philosopher and social reformer, playing a key role in the formation of the Brahmo Samaj. As Ramakrishna became aware of the effects his teachings could have, he was overwhelmed by a calling to make use of his powers. He knew that the God within him wasn't realized only for personal salvation, but for the love and service of humanity. His mission became to seek those who were one step behind him and to establish a new order of people who would transmit his message of universality. The Ramakrishna Order universal love and the universal message that all religions give. Now he spent his days and nights waiting, waiting for his first disciples to come forward. These were two middle-class intellectuals from Calcutta. They had read of Paramhansa in a Brahmo Samaj journal which attracted their attention. Captivated by his charm and character, they brought him his first disciples who'd carry his legacy. Rakhal Chandra Ghosh, who had become known as Brahmananda, and another fellow called Narendranath Dutt, whom you might know as Vivekananda. These two became the first of the Ramakrishna order. Between 1879 and 1885, a considerable amount of disciples gathered around Paramhansa dedicated to his cause. They became exponents of his thought. Every day now, Ramakrishna addressed a crowd full of people from different parts of life and of faith. He spent about 20 hours a day replying to their queries. As his health weakened, he never turned anyone back. Although he addressed all those who reached out to him, he was extremely strict in his choice of disciples. He often said it wasn't him who chose, but the Divine Mother herself. His spiritual sensitivity had become so heightened that he could read the souls of all those who approached him. And if he accepted some as disciples, it was with full knowledge. What Ramakrishna offered his disciples was not akin to the teachings of the time, be it of European systems or Indian ones. He didn't accept the treaties of the Guru and join the utmost respect from the pupils, as was the system in India. He put himself on the same level as his young disciples. He was their companion and talked with the same familiarity, without any trace of superiority. He often exclaimed, God cannot be won by a system of ritual, but only by love and sincerity. Rather than spending time discussing metaphysics, Ramakrishna believed in the importance of personal experience. He taught that one must experiment first and only then believe in God. That belief must not precede but follow religious or spiritual experiences. His presence was required to facilitate only two things he believed. To take care that his disciples were sane and sincere, other than that, they were to arrive at their answers themselves through experience. From 1881, Ramakrishna lived at Dakshineshwar, surrounded by disciples who loved and revered him. He had by now transformed into a person in whose midst no sorrow could grow. But now he was permanently nearing the expansive ocean of the formless, which he had dipped in and out of innumerable times. The end of his life was approaching. His feeble body was worn out by serving the starving crowd. In 1884, his health took a serious turn. While in a trance, he dislocated his left arm. As he was coming to terms with its pain, the following year, his throat became inflamed. The strain from constantly talking and dangerous samadhis didn't make it any easier. 
The doctors he consulted now explicitly forbade him both speech and entering ecstatic states. His health progressively got worse. It became impossible for him to eat and yet he continued to take in visitors seeking advice. One night his throat hemorrhaged and he was diagnosed with throat cancer. Three or four days before his death, he called upon Vivekananda. He asked to be left alone with him. He enveloped him into an ecstasy and upon returning said to him, Today I have given you my all and am now only a poor fakir, possessing nothing. By this power, you will do immense good in the world and not until it is accomplished will you return. From this moment, all his powers were transferred to Naren and the disciple and guru became one. On the night of August the 15th, 1886, he cried thrice the name of his beloved Kali and lay back. This was his final ecstasy in mortal form. In his own words, he had passed from one room to another. It would only be natural for you to wonder what his disciples were wondering at the time as well. Did Ramakrishna get throat cancer because of bad karma? And why was he not treating himself using his spiritual powers? Well, since Ramakrishna was an avatar and not a mortal human, he was free from the cycle of karma. As we saw earlier, he consciously decided to come back from Samadhi even after becoming one with God. Another aspect to take heed of here is that one of the reasons that Ramakrishna got cancer is that he'd often take upon him the sins and karmas of those who sought his help. As a guru, selfless and ever-loving, he took it upon himself to pay for the karmas of others. Lastly, the reason that Paramhansa didn't use his powers or Siddhi to heal himself is that his spirit no longer belonged to him, but the Divine. And to use powers for self-preservation, he wouldn't set the best example for his disciples and could risk opening the doors to the madness of others. As a Guru, there is a lot that Paramhansa had to constantly battle with. Ramakrishna's philosophy is highlighted by Ayon Maharaj of the Ramakrishna order in his book Infinite Paths to Infinite Reality is rooted in the experience of what Paramhansa called the Gyan, which harmonizes conflicting religious faiths, sects, philosophies and spiritual disciplines. To fully understand the Gyan of Vedanta, Ayon Maharaj gives us the six central tenets of this philosophy by observing the life and teaching of Paramhansa as we saw earlier in the video. After attaining Brahma Gyan in Nirvikalp Samadhi, ordinary people leave their body in 21 days. But certain divine people known as Ishvara Kotis can return and attain the Gyana, a spiritual state in which the perfect Gyana and Bhakti are combined. Since the rational intellect is inherently limited, spiritual experience alone is the reliable basis for arriving at spiritual truths. Based on the Gyan, we can affirm truths about God and spiritual experience that appear to be contradictory or illogical to the rational intellect. God is infinite and illimitable. Hence, God is both personal and impersonal, with and without form, both immanent in the universe and transcendent to it. There are two levels of Advaitic realization. While the Gyani realized the non-dual nature of reality in Nirvikalp Samadhi, the Vigyani returns to attain the richer, world-affirming, non-dualistic realization that God has become everything. The Vigyani, who accepts both the Nitya or the Eternal and the Leela or Divine Play, can adopt various attitudes and forms of union with God on different planes of consciousness. Various religious faiths and spiritual philosophies are equally valid paths to realizing God. After having understood the ups and downs of Ramakrishna's journey, these tenets have been synthesized by the experience of a lifetime of incessant devotion and seeking. Then again, the question remains, was Ramakrishna mad or divine? What's the verdict? At the onset, a person who stripped bare in front of Kali's idol, refused to eat and sleep and took no regard towards socially acceptable norms, how can this person be an avatar? Is no one protected from insanity? The answers already lie in the course of his life, only if you look closely. Until the arrival of Bhairavi Brahmi, Ramakrishna was searching for God like a blind man, swimming without guidance and therefore always trampling at the edge of madness. It is only when Bhairavi entered his life as a guru that she could oversee his experiments. In her, Paramhansa found the first person he could confess to. 
By this time, those who surrounded him had declared him mad. But Bhairavi told him that he had reached states talked about in the scriptures through mere experimentation. As his life was graced by more gurus like Dotapuri, Ramakrishna no longer fell into the trap of madness. One of the reasons could also be that after the practice of Tantra, he defeated many of his mental disturbances. Ramakrishna was probably aware of this. Or else, why would he levy utmost importance on his pupils maintaining sanity at all costs? He had felt the dangers of an unstable mind firsthand. It begs one to think, what many on the onset saw as madness could also have been spiritual fearlessness. That Ramakrishna held no fears of self-preservation, of life or his mind, he was willing to give his pursuit all that it takes. And without this, he wouldn't have known divinity either. After all, Gandhi himself said that he was a living embodiment of godliness. Was it madness, fearlessness or a divinity beyond our understanding? What do you think? Let us know in the comments below.